do you have some? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I just have a few business things. Um, and I sent, I actually sent it to you guys when I sent you the zoom link. Um, but just for this shoot, um, whatever you do, if you, you could send me two images by April 24th, that will give me enough time to get, um, to get the PowerPoint done. I don't know who this last person who came in, it says Valencia Falls resident. All right. Here comes all the rest of the people. Barbara. <laughs> okay. Well, they're right on that. Bob Oppenheimer, is that you? Yes, it is. Okay, you're coming through as Valencia Falls resident. Oh, okay. I just know that happened to you one one time before, so. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'm trying to. Okay. I, I'm all right. on my phone and I can't change it. Okay. I can't believe how many phone calls I'm getting when I'm not supposed to be doing anything. They'll just have to wait. Um, okay, so the little short agenda that I have is pictures to me for this review by April 24th. The review is on April 28th, and I'll, of course, send out reminders. Um, I wanted to just go over um, two or three things for the coming, for next season. Um, unless people have a rampant objection, we're going to go ahead and plan for a live photography show next year. Yeah. And anybody see any reason why we should not? At this time, no, but who knows? The, the, the only issue is we, we really don't know what's going to happen to the clubhouse. Right. Well, so when, I, when Meg met with the presidents of all the clubs a couple of weeks ago, she said we could go ahead and ask for dates through March. Um, that she felt comfortable that um, she was going to plan the social calendar through March and higher entertainment and whatever, but only through March, like March, no dates in April or anything like that. So we usually do this at the very, very beginning of March or the last weekend in February. <clears throat> but I wanted to find out when the Florida Camera Club Council Conference was next year so we don't conflict. So Ann sent an email for us and we're waiting to hear. Um, but it, it, you know, we'll do it for that week. Look, we've got this virtual thing you know, handled. So if we have to go back to virtual, we'll go to virtual. But at yes. least we were <laughs> aiming in a good direction. <laughs> um, okay, so just to give you, that was the update, update on that. Um, one thing I just wanted to get your feedback on, and I'm actually going to send an email to the whole club, is this year for the first year, we tried hard to um, keep our meetings to a specific date. Oh, and they're mowing the lawn. I'm so excited. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, we did the first, we aimed for the first Tuesday of the month. Um, of course, that meant that some people could never come because whatever, they had something on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, in the previous years, we've been um, fluctuating. So like one month, it could be on a Tuesday, another month, it would be on a Thursday, the core group got to decide which day of the month it was, um, which allowed more people the flexibility of attending just because maybe they couldn't come on Tuesday, but they could come on Thursday or Friday or whatever. Um, I just wanted some feedback from you guys. How do you think we should do it? A fixed date or fluctuating dates? Personally, I prefer a Tuesday morning. Yeah, a fixed date is the best. There's so many meetings, Adrian. I think um, a fixed date. And if we have to, we change it. If, if it's a holiday, you change it anyway. Right. Well, we had like we did do that. We did that for this one. Right. <clears throat> so okay. I am gonna poll the group, but you guys feel we should stay with the fixed date. Okay, and, and the first Tuesday of the month was based on a poll. You know, that was the day that most people felt that they were free. Um, and that's all you can do when you have a large group. And we have 50 members. We're never going to get it so that everybody can attend everything. Just doesn't work that way. Um, OK, and should we this is the issue with last with next season. If we can only schedule through March that we don't normally we do have a meeting in May. We didn't do one this year. I don't remember why, but um, normally we have a meeting in May. With the clubhouse renovation a possibility, do we want to start the season live and then go to Zoom or do we want to keep these meetings on Zoom? What is your feeling? 
Well, can we keep them? Can we keep them live? And then, if there are only like two meetings left, March and April, couldn't they be? Uh, if everything's okay with uh, COVID, could they be someplace where we all meet? Like, I remember when I first joined the group, we sometimes met at a restaurant or whatever. Um, can we do that for two meetings? Well, the problem with doing that is there's no audio visual. You know, you go back to having it like we did in the cafe. Um, right. I don't think we ever had an actual meeting. We would have lunch and a discussion after yeah. we did a shoot, but I don't think we ever had like the business meeting and the, I, mean, I can't remember that. Um, but yeah, certainly we could, you know, just keep it flexible and see where we are at that point. Adrian, which do you get a better participation? Zoom or live? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I Literally, like I don't remember anymore. I personally like the Zoom meetings. Um, it's, it's very good as far as the presentations are concerned. And you can use audio visual. It's very good. Okay. Adrian, uh, I, would, I would say the same thing that Susan said in one regard. When we were on the TV screens or we're on the projectors, whatever it is we're using to project images, which is a lot of what we do, either in the demonstration of, of a presentation or review, it's very difficult to say, well, gee, if we cropped it this way, or if we just brightened it, or we did this, you can't do any of that effectively on, on the TV screen because the images come out with color distortion. They're not nearly as good as they are when we go on Zoom in terms of transferring the information with the correct settings. I just, I always find that whenever we did anything on Zoom, uh, in live on the, on the TV, it was like, God, my pictures were dark, light, colors were right. skewed. It was horrible. Um, but yeah, I, like I, I like Zoom too. I'm very comfortable being home. I can see everything. I can hear everything clearly. It's better for me than to be in a large group. And then when we go on the shoots, we're together at that right. point. Right. So it's yeah. a, a nice mix. Yeah. It's up to what everybody feels. But. Also on Zoom, if you're away and you're sitting there, nothing to do, you can click on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Herb Froelich likes the fact that we're on Zoom. A couple of times he actually was able to join us, which was nice. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll put that to the whole group and see what people think, but I can um, give them this piece of discussion and see what people, you know, how people feel a bit about it. It'll be interesting because... I really have like three or four things for them to vote on. We'll see what kind of response I get. Um, okay, the other thing was um, to remind you about the Florida Camera Club Council. You have till the end of the month to enter your images. Um, and I encourage you to do so. Um, the next cafe topic is gates and fences. And after that, we have one more topic, which is um, like Green K. It's, I can't remember what, how we, uh, wetlands. It was called yeah, wetlands. Uh, um, so it's time to vote on more topics. So I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll um, ask the group about the photography, the, the little questions we had from here, the fixed date and the Zoom versus live meetings. Um, and then I'll send a second email out to vote for uh, extended topics and see if we can get four more, which will take us through next year and into the, into the 2024. Um, so you're sticking with the uh, wetlands. I wasn't sure. Do you, well, we the group voted no. on that, so. Okay, that's fine. I just didn't want to put it on the website without yeah. knowing for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, we go through the trouble of all the voting. It would be, I mean, I have no idea how that's going to look in the cafe. It's just going to be sort of interesting. I mean, that's Loxahatchee and Green K and Wakota Hatchie. Um, so people actually can start, you know, doing birds and, I mean, it, it is what what you get there. Um, we got really good re response to our Valencia Falls topic in the cafe now that it's up. Oh, yeah. People sent me emails. I mean, somebody sent an email saying that um, they were going to show it to the designer for the clubhouse because they thought we should use them someplace. We did that last time, if you remember correctly. Um, and some of those images from the last time we had Valencia Falls are in the bathrooms on, on the walls, like in the tennis bathrooms um, and some of the other places around the clubhouse in the office. I think there's one because um, they were really nice and they depicted the community. So um, 
excuse yeah. me, Adrian, um, the beautiful flowers that are in the courtroom, um, I'm sure they're going to be changed after all these years. What do we intend to do with them? Are, are you going to sell them and give them to charity or what's the, have anyone thought about those pictures? I mean, the frames can always be changed, but I think the flowers are gorgeous. Yeah, nobody has said anything to me. I think um, one is mine, one is Kit's. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to go in there and look and then I see think what... the rest of them are kits. Yeah, I have two that are in the courtroom, so I'm not sure what will happen to them, but there is a lot of them in the courtroom. They're beautiful flowers. I don't yeah. know if anyone could use them in their help. Yeah, but they're, and they're um, so in the hallway, there's that huge photograph that was Norm as Norman Sherman's, like but mm -hmm. by over by the um yeah. You know, the uh, conference room kind of thing. Um, I'll find out about that. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have anything for the good of the group? I think we pulled off a good season. You know, we have two two COVID seasons under our belt and, you know, we kept the club thriving. Um, so I'm proud of that. And, you and know, we're everybody. All okay. We're all okay, thankfully. Yeah, Thank we're God. all okay. Miriam, you have a question? Um, no, just... Uh, uh, if somebody could help me, my home health aide doesn't come till 10 o'clock and she's been getting stuck at the gate. So I'm going to try to drive to the clubhouse for 10 o'clock, but I would need help from someone to get my walker out of the car. So if somebody would please uh, do that for me when I get there. Okay, we'll find gonna you. We're going to be shooting today, right? Yes. So I need help getting the walker out of the car. Okay. If someone would please, uh, you know, help me with that. OK, so park on the side, not the tennis cart side, like the, park other side. the handicap side. That's where right. I park. OK, OK, okay great. Thank you. Okay. You can take my hand away. OK. OK, um, the two people that are presenting today are Anne and Eileen, um, and I'm going to turn this over to them. All right, I'm going to take the share screen here if I can. Uh, So, all righty, so good morning. Eileen and I have been uh, working at um, developing an arsenal of ICM images that can give you uh, a better idea about what's out there to shoot, how to shoot it, techniques, things that will excite you or not, perhaps. But there's always one or two that will excite you while it's right not. Um, what is ICM, okay? ICM is simply camera movement during the exposure. Or it could be lens movement. That's part of your camera during the exposure. So if you're moving the camera in any way or you're moving and, and turning your lens in any way, you're creating an ICM. And I just want to explain that it's different. And for example, if you are panning a subject, a biker that's going across, a dog running across you, and you're moving your camera with the animal or with the person on the bike, the background will be blurred, but you might be able to get the image in a, a, a reasonable focus. And it doesn't require a long exposure, by the way, to do that. But that is part of ICM. It's just at a faster exposure rate. If I put my camera on a tripod and the water is moving, or people are walking, or there's a dog moving on the beach, but my camera is still, and I drop my, my, my shutter speed down so the shutter speed is uh, slower and there's more light coming in, that, that in essence will also create a blur, but that's not ICM because your camera was dead still, either in your hands or on the tripod. So there's gotta be movement of the lens of the camera. The other thing I wanna tell you, which is kind of exciting about this is there are very few rules. Once you set your camera or your smartphone with various settings, after that, the sky's the limit. You, you manipulate things differently, but there's no right and there's no wrong. Some of the images that we shoot will excite some because it, it appeals to them. Total abstract where you can't recognize the subject, or it could be a minimal movement which creates something where you can tell what it is, but it's intriguing with either color, curves, shape, form, painting, all different. So, and it doesn't take a, a brain surgeon to do this. It's really kind of easy. Um, variables that can create the ICM. How fast you move your camera. 
when you're doing your camera movement, are you moving the camera quickly across or are you moving it slowly across? It could have to do with how long your shutter speed is set for. If I go with a really slow shutter, there's gonna be more blur. If I move the shutter speed up so it's a little faster, there'll be less blur. That's another variable to play with. And also the pattern of movement. This is key. Do I go in? Do I start out and then come back in? They're two different pictures. You will get a different impact when you go out versus coming in. I can go diagonally and move my camera up in a diagonal swoop. I can wiggle it. I can shake it. I can do this. I can make curves. I can also make circles. So it depends upon it depends upon the, the technique that you use with the impact you're gonna have in your image. And my feeling is basically with all those types of movement, how do you know where to start? You pick one and you experiment with the technique and you learn how fast, how slow to rotate the camera, how far in the range of motion to rotate it. Do you just go in and out a little bit or do you go way in and way out with your zoom or your hands and step into the picture? All of that will change the impact that it will have on the final image on your subjects. So the other thing I will tell you is you need to shoot, shoot, keep shooting, keep shooting. And you'll say, oh my God, because everyone's different. You will never be able to reproduce the same exact picture. They will all be different. And I'm gonna tell you that you've got to shoot a ton. You will delete a lot because in the end you might have one picture out of 30, 40, 50 that you'll say, gee, that's worth working with. The other ones you don't like. And it might, might be the subject that you picked that might have determined that. But when you get to the point and you go home and you've got 50 images, look at them all. And then the bottom line is on the seventh day, God made the delete key. Just delete them. It's easy. You don't like it. Bang, delete it. Shoot a ton. And be risky when you shoot in terms of what you're going to do also when you edit in terms of editing ferociously. And that can be on your iPhone. You do not need to edit in the computer. You can edit on your iPhone. You've got saturation. You've got brilliant sliders. You've got uh, clarity sliders. So you can, and you can also crop. Be careful with the with the cell phone or the smartphone when you crop too much because we all know that that affects the resolution of the final picture. So when you decide to edit, be aggressive with your edit. Take a picture, crop it, or don't even turn it upside down. Turn it left or right. Reverse it. Flip it horizontally or vertically. Just keep playing around or take a small portion. Gee, I like this part of the plant that I got, but I hate the rest of it. Take that out, and then edit that part. So you'll find things that will be somewhat abstract. Then you'll find things that look like a painting where you still have the shape and the form of the picture and you can kind of see what it is. Um, so the where to start is try the different movements with the camera lens, which I'll show you when we get up there is easy. Then you're gonna try changing the speed of the motion. Then you try the range of the motion. Bottom corner to the top, what I would just do, go in the middle and focus in the middle and do a little bit of that. So it depends, like I said, there's a million different shots that you'll get. Every one of them is gonna be a surprise. They'll all be a surprise. Um, the other thing I will tell you regarding DSLRs, you will have a little more control and more creative scope in what you can do with a DSLR because on that you can put a zoom lens. You can do it with a regular lens, but you won't be able to zoom in and out. By the way, zooming your lens from one part of the uh, focal length to the other is called racking the lens. It's just a, a term. So if I say to you that we're doing the racking of the lens, you know, you're moving the lens and you're zooming in and out. If you zoom out, you'll get one impact. If you zoom in, you'll get another. And it all depends upon how steady your hands are with keeping what you wanted in focus to be in the center. If I want the eye of this picture you're seeing in front to be the main focus, I'm gonna twist around that or I'm gonna start there, focus there, hesitate for a minute and then move. So more of the picture will be in or out. And I'm just gonna give you this because this would be the ICM of that picture. That's Eileen's picture that was done with a smartphone. It more or less distorts the picture. You can tell what it is. 
you can't really see the background, but you've taken a picture of someone else on the wall, on the, on the graffiti area in Miami and Windward, and you can distort that image and then make that image your own, which you can always do also by turning black and white. So that makes the image different from the person or the sculpture or the vase. You're not stealing their artwork per se and then showing it as your own. You're distorting it and changing it to your own creation, which is a little more acceptable in the world of photography. Um, so again, edit, edit, edit. And I'm gonna go through some of these to show you some of the techniques and I'll just go over them briefly. You can either move up, you can start up, you can move down. You can start in, I'm now got a cell phone in my hands, okay? I can move out. And if I want more range of motion with that, I will move out while I'm stepping in and I'm holding the live view focus in the center. You can also take the cell phone and you can turn it. You can take your camera with a DSLR and you can turn it, not the lens, turn the camera. You can also with the DSLR, hold the camera dead still and work your zoom. And in order to get that radial explosion, the only way you're gonna get that by zooming, although my hand is moving this way, the camera zoom is going in and out is by stepping aggressively with your cell phone to move in and to move out. You can create ghosts. Um, you can pick up, you can move diagonally. You can wiggle subjects, what works? Things with light, uh, bright colors, things, lights at night, curves, sweeping color like plants. Um, you can take a, anything, you can take a Coca-Cola machine and, or a soda machine and you can, ex, you can play with that. Anything that's bright, anything that's got color to it, anything that has shape and form to it, something where there's different tonalities within the picture. If you just shoot a tree and you only aim at the green leaves, it will be boring. But if you shoot the tree and leave part of the trunk in, which is brown and the tree is now green, then what happens is you can move up, you can move all left and right, you can create a forest kind of look and you can create different tonality. So I'm just gonna bounce through these. I'm not gonna spend a long time talking about them, but I wanna tell you that on the cell phone, you can get some really fun things. So. And you can shoot anywhere, anytime. There's nowhere where you can't do ICF, any time of the day. If you have a DSLR, you might need a neutral density filter in the highest points of light in the day. I'll explain that after. So this was Eileen's before, this was Eileen's after. Then Eileen shot this out in Valencia Falls. Notice the trees have a nice sense of movement to it. You still can recognize there's a little bit of path there. There's some sky, there's some trees, but it looks like an abstract painting. And it's very, very well done. And she took these, which are, uh, I don't know if they're dracenas or some sort of palmy leaves out in the garden outside. Could you, could you say what she did to get that? Not necessarily because it's very hard, but I will tell you, for example, with this, the movement looks to me like it's left to right or right to left because the trees have moved where there's another tree next to it. Okay. Yep, sweeping lines, I would guess, and I don't even think we can't even remember half the time what we do. That's but the this other is a single different. red dracaena plant. Right, and then she's, this looks like it had an upward motion this way. It looks like it was an upward kind of motion, a little diagonal, but you can see where the sweeping lines, but this is confusing down here because that's going left to right. Um, this was, uh, I think a left to right or a right to left, but you can see the ghost in the picture of the person that looks like they're in the water. And here's our fountain with the um, houses behind, which are very blurred. So there was a pretty, pretty good motion on this. I would say maybe a speed or a good length of motion. This looks like a painting that she shot with her iPhone. It's dark on the left, light on the right fountain in the middle, it's down one of the lagoons, and you can see it really looks like a painting. And you can see, look at the, this is up and down also, because you can see where the outline was here and then the camera either dropped. That would be my guess there. This and is that, these are all in Valencia Falls, like that was right at the, where the North Gazebo is. Yep. And this is um, simply fountains in the, in the buildings behind giving a little sense of movement to the water and the fountains. It's very artistic, very creative. You don't have to like it. However, it might whet the appetite of some artists. 
is very subjective. So all these things are creative and artistic and it's a matter of what you like. So be true to your own self. This is lovely. Here's the tree, here's the bark, here's the, 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 um, the curve. Eileen, do you remember what you did with the camera then? Did you move it laterally a little bit? It looks like you did. It looks like up and down. I'm sure I would get up and down because it's the tree that the branches and the leaves are all pointing straight up. It could be, but it's I see the that I now have as my background on the Zoom call. Right. So this is, if you look here, you'll see a tree here and a tree here. Now that tree could just be shaded in the back or that could be the tree that was moved to here. Can't really tell. Sometimes when you move your camera, you think you're going up, but you're doing this. So there is a diagonal. And sometimes when you, when you go to move up, you, you move the camera left to right. And all it takes is a little bit of motion to move it and you're gonna get a combined motion. I am in love with this. Eileen shot this uh, with cell phone. Oh. That is just phenomenal. There's a clear subject. It's the rabbit. Um, artistically, I think it's stunning. And I love the, uh, the pink color, the green leaves, a little red inside the leaves. Um, and again, which way, I don't know, Eileen, which way you went. It was very, not a lot of motion, just a little bit of motion, it looks like. Enough to distort, but not take it out into a total abstract. I so, took about a hundred shots there. I cannot remember the movement. And listen carefully to what she's taking. She went outside, sat on the ground, got eye level with that bunny and shot and shot and shot and shot. And then in it, the end, the, the um, uh, on the um, what, on the metadata over here, it says this is two seconds. Well, we'll get into that because yes, that's a change. I'm going to have you start differently. Okay. But absolutely, that's a that's a play. And the question is, if she was two seconds within that two seconds, what did she do? Did right. she move quickly? Did she move fast? Did she move with a big range of motion? Two seconds allows a lot of time to move the camera versus, let's say, a half a second or a full second. So then you, if you don't contain your motion and you're shooting at two seconds, you're going to have a lot more distortion if you're as aggressive as you are with one second. And so, clearly because of the bunny looking like a bunny, I didn't move much. Correct. Is that a real bunny or a toy? It's a, it's a lands across the street. It's on the landscape of my neighbor and it's a stone thing there. There are no paws that show. It looks, it looks like he's wearing red pants and he has paws, but that's not at all that. It's those little red things from the landscaping going up there. And that's what makes it so exciting is what might have been isn't necessarily what you see. But the question is, you look at it and does it give you a wow feeling? Does it excite you? To me, that one did. I, I really, really like that one. So. And Yes. Question. How do you know when you accidentally move the camera when you were taking a picture and you're really trying to take uh, an ICM? <laughs> well, I, I'm beginning to take a picture and I accidentally move. It can happen all the time. All of us have done, and all of us have done that at times. You've either moved the camera or the other accident is you didn't remember where your shutter speed was and your shutter speed was very low, maybe maybe even one over 60, you were hand holding and the subject moves. Right. Okay, that would be motion blur, but you could also make the mistake and get camera blur by accidentally moving your camera or banging when you were taking it or walking into, it, it, it's, there's no way to reproduce it, but it can create a pleasant surprise that you like, absolutely. So this, can you tell what it is? Yes. Soda machine. Yeah. So I, I was teaching. Refrigerator. Yeah. Right. So I was in a hotel and one of my friends said, well, how do you do that? I said, yeah, give me your cell phone. So this was a cell phone shot that she took or I took and she also took. And then I said, now move your camera, move it faster. Move the, move the camera up faster, up and down. We did. And then we got that. Wow. So you can get total abstract or not total abstract. It depends upon what you like. In this case, it might make a great textured background for something else. For those of you who like to put a background on a light board or use it as a composite, there's all kinds of things that I keep these because you never know when that will reappear again with something else over it. 
Um, this was Nancy. We were in Morikami. <laughs> and I said to Eileen, there's the bamboo behind. I said, so do an ICM and Nancy. And that was simply an up and down. We stretched her a little bit and moved the trees a little bit. That was cell phone. <laughs> this is also cell phone. It's ghosts in the clubhouse. That's Eileen. I can tell. <laughs> you want to know how to create, you can intentionally create a ghost. And turning it black and white gives it more of a ghostly like appearance. Now, in my mind, because what I might do with that, and David, I know that you would think the same way, Barbara, probably Ira, a lot of us, Harvey, we would take this, Miriam too, Adrian, take it out, crop out the ghost and put the ghost in another picture somewhere else. So, but in and of itself, it's kind of cool to create ghosts. We tried to do it on the beach one night with light painting, it was funny. I'm in the car with my cell phone. Yes, somebody else was driving, I wasn't driving. <laughs> And I turned around and we were going over the bridge. So I took my camera, I put it on that slow shutter speed app. I turned around and went up and that's the picture I got of the bridge with my cell phone from inside the car through the windshield. And it doesn't matter that the windshield might have not been clean, doesn't matter what else was going on because you could blur it anyway. This is great for all of you people who have problems shooting tech sharp. You don't yeah. need to ever shoot tech sharp to do these. Um, that's a vase that's in the clubhouse, which is I'll show you today. Is, these are now going more into the clubhouse shots. That was a cell phone shot that I took. This was a cell phone shot that I took. It was of a little vase hanging on one of the, one of the shelves. This was a kind of a mirror-like thing that I played with. This was a little bowl full of three little global balls in it. And you notice the radial explosion. That's racking the lens, I can tell you right now. I, not, but I can't rack the lens, so when I say that with my cell phone, I move the cell phone up and down, and also in and out at the same time. This was clearly in and out, because that gives you the radial explosion. When you go in and out, you're gonna get that. This was up and down, and it just kind of blurred it a little bit that way. Oh, this one, there's another mirror, only I've got me in the mirror with Eileen. And that was a uh, cell phone. And that I just moved from here in and out and I got a radial explosion. And that is the flag in the arts and crafts room. That was a diagonal movement with my cell phone. You can see where the lines are going up. You can see the shapes coming across this way and swirling up. So, this was on the beach. I took my cell phone and I just simply moved it across. That's all I did. And then you get no defining lines between. And the faster you move, the better. If I had moved it and wiggled it up a little bit as I was going, I might not have even gotten this line here. But look what it does to the water and the foam where the breakers are and the beach. It blends the tones in. And you either like that or you don't. So here comes something interesting. We walked into, Brenda and I and Eileen walked in downtown in the Del Rey shoot that day. And we walked into a lobby and there was this set up in the lobby. You can't quite see it clearly because we didn't take a real clear shot of it. But this was it. In the center of the lobby was this big thing with blue carpet, these big flower pots with trees and color in them. And I walked in there and I was like a kid in a candy store. I said, oh my God, this is just ideal. So that, I shot with my cell phone. Eileen went in real close to it, picked a part of it out, and that's what Eileen got, which was a painting. Wow. I then swung my phone and turned and twisted my phone, and I got that. Then I took my DSLR, and here we go, and with the DSLR, I racked the lens. So what you got is you can see it exploding down, out, up, and left and right, you get you just got a massive explosion of out. Now it depends upon how fast you rack it and how the range of motion you start. If I have an 18 to 400 and I start at 18 and go to 400, you won't even recognize anything. But if I start at 18 and just rack it a little bit and go to maybe 30, 40, 50, you'll get more something like that. That's downtown in that hotel. Eileen, do you remember where that hotel was? The corner of Atlantic and uh, the uh, A1A. 
that place that used to be the old Marriott on the left. There's a, a beautiful hotel in there. It's the Opal. Right. Go in there. We went all over that hotel. We had a blast in there. <laughs> uh, Adrian, that's where I got that crazy shot that you wanted for the view. Yeah. Eileen and I and Brenda. Okay. This was my cell phone. Uh -huh. um, I then edited it and I turned it black and white and I just left the eyes. But that was a picture of graffiti on a wall that I turned into my own. This was the color ICM that I took with my, that other one was a smartphone. This was my DSLR. There's that radial motion again with the rocking of the lens. Only yet I was, I worked and I must have shot 75 pictures of this because I wanted one eye to be totally in. So when you're rocking your lens and you're not on a tripod, you've got to hold that thing dead still so that the center of where you first focus stays and everything explodes from that point out. So, um, and no, none of these were taken on a tripod. You can use the tripod. This shot would be easier on the tripod. This also would be easier on the tripod because all you do is set up your iPhone or your tripod, or your uh, DSLR, and then you simply, you know how you can just turn your lens on the swivel amount? Just swivel the lens around so it stays even. Um, but this was, a D, this was DSLR. Okay, this, which many of you have seen, was a distortion of a painting on the wall in Windward. And this was DSLR. Mm. Um, and that was done with, I don't know that I wrapped the lens here. I think I just moved the lens slightly. Now here's and, and what, I, what I'm noticing, and I'm looking at the metadata, is that you're not setting this at three seconds or five seconds. These are all at one third of a second, one half a second. Correct. Not, not really that. Not really that slow. That's correct. And that's where I'm telling you to set your DSLRs. I'm telling you to start at a third of a second. And that's why I tell you on the cell phone, start at one second, because the cell phone has a different way. You don't get the same racking of the lens to. You've got, you've got to have a little more time to walk in or walk out. You need more time for the motion to the cell phone. But if you look at this, you tell me what that is. Anybody know? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. I want to know that before you do your abstract, wouldn't it be a good idea to take a single shot of what it is So in the original? So if anybody should ask you where you got it, then you can say, this is what it looked like before I did X, Y, and Z. And also when I shoot, I, I do bracketing. So I'm always gonna get one darker, one at zero, and one at, you know, one lighter, you know, from minus a third to plus a third. So we should we stu still do that if, if you are inclined to do so. You can do that. I'm gonna stay away from that today and keep it simple, but yes, you can do that. And I will say this to Miriam, you are absolutely right about taking an establishing shot. When I was playing with a lot of this stuff, I was too stupid to think of that. Mm. I didn't even know where I was going with it. I just said, let me play. And then I said, oh shit, I wish I had gone back and really gotten that shot and taken it you know, right with an establishing shot. So the answer to that is yes, take it first so you remember where you got it. Um, okay, I have a question. I think it has to do with the time of, of exposure. Um, I've played around with ICM and my indoor shots came out really nice, but everything outdoor was all blown out and too white. So that means right. that the, the seconds were too long, right? No. No. If you start moving your seconds down to the point where you, you make a faster shutter speed to avoid being overexposed, and this will only be on the DSLR because the cell phone, it's not that much of an issue. It's on auto IS, it'll do what it needs to do. And on the DSLRs, if you look at your meter and you look at a histogram and you blow the picture out, then the answer is this. I'm gonna tell you on your DSLR to start at a third of a second. Okay. Now, if you were to change that and make that faster because it's blown out, you've lost the creative potential because this whole thing is based upon a slow shutter. So that's not what you want to change to correct it. Maybe you can go up a little bit from, from a third to, um, you can go to maybe, you can range from a half to, um, to a fifth of a second. But within that realm, if you change out of that to balance your exposure, you're screwed with ICM, you can't do it. 
you won't get the blur. So now the next step is if you're on ISO, put it as low as you can make it. As low as your camera will let you go. I can go 64, but some most people can only go to 100. Go to 100. Those two things you do not change. The only thing you play with at that point to get a balanced exposure is your f-stop. It doesn't make any difference when you're doing ICM and you're racking lenses and you're moving, whether or not you've got a big depth of field or a small depth of field. So if you start with your f-stop around 16 and it's still blown out, go to 22. If it's still blown out and you can't go any higher, I can on my cameras. Sometimes you can't on your cameras. If you can't get higher than F22, rather than move the shutter speed to make it faster, don't do that. Get a neutral density filter and throw it on the front of your camera. It's going to drop the light down and cut the light down, at least the stop. And that's the answer. It's a simple filter. Put it on the front. Done. So if you're outside and you're shooting direct sunlight, you can shoot ICM any time of the day by either manipulating your f-stop, that's the key thing, f-stop. It has no impact when you do an ICM because you're changing the depth of field with your zoom lens and everything else you're doing. So ignore it. Okay, did that answer your question, Doris? Yeah, so as high as possible, the f-stop. I yep. can start like well, that. as high okay. as you need, right? If you sort of 16 and you get a balanced exposure with your histogram, um, leave it. If you're not and you say, oh, gee, it's really blown out. It's swung over to the right and it's too bright, too light. Then move the f-stop up. That's it. Now, you, okay. so, so along with that line also means where do you shoot in your exposure mode? You don't want to shoot an aperture priority because what it will do is it will change the shutter speed to balance out the exposure. And we just said you never want to allow the camera to change the shutter speed. So if you go in shutter speed priority, what will shutter speed priority do to balance out the exposure? It'll change your aperture, which is exactly what I'm saying you could do manually if you were in a manual exposure mode. So if I set up at a third of a, a second, and I'm, and, I, and I'm in manual exposure and I have my ISO all the way down, the only thing I can do is play with my f-stop, move it to a higher number or put a filter on it. That's it. If you do in shutter speed priority, it will adjust your aperture as much as it can. And if you're still blown out, same purpose, put on a neutral density filter and make sure your ISO is all the way down. Don't shoot an auto ISO. Don't let that be the thing that makes you determine the, the exposure in a picture. You only have three things to play with, which is shutter speed, which you don't want to change, ISO, which is going to be all the way down, and the last factor you can play with the balanced exposure is an f-stop. So beat it up, boost the f-stop all the way up, or put a neutral density filter on. And, and Barbara has a question. Sure. And um, I'm not that familiar with cell phone shooting. And how would you set your cell phone in order to get a longer exposure? I, I don't know how to do that at all. Okay. On the handout that we gave you, did you download the slow shutter app? If no. you don't have that slow shutter app on there, you will be lost with what we're going to do in the clubhouse. Okay. You need to download that. It's called slow shutter speed. I can show you, Barb, what it looks like. It's it's pennies. It's maybe a couple bucks. It's not big. Oh, and Randy, Mary. You see this little, let's see if I can get this. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, where are you? There. Hold on. Uh, it's, on the, it's in the handouts, but. Okay. I'll, this, I'll print it. I didn't have time last it's night. It's called slow shutter. Let me just see if I can pull it up on. And then when you go in the slow shutter app, you set it exactly the way I'm telling you to set it, which is motion blur, blur strength is low, shutter speed is one second, ISO is auto. There's four okay. settings on the menu. So you need to come up to the clubhouse after we get off. And you should all bring a cell phone with you because sometimes all you have to shoot with is a cell phone. We can easily do both because Eileen and I can split. Eileen knows exactly what to do with the cell phone. So you set it. You've got to have the app. If you don't have the app, we're going to be screwed as far as what we're doing today with the phone. And if you don't have that and you have a DSLR, fine. We'll work with the DSLR and we'll go from there. Okay? Yep. It's, e you. it's easy to download. You can download it now, Barbara. It is very okay. easy. And it can work on an Android. It works on Android or it's available also for a uh, iPhone. Yeah. 
And what is that? What is that subject matter we're looking at now? <clears throat> Can guess, huh? It's a uh, guitar. Oh wow! It's a guitar on the wall that was hung on the wall in the guitar hotel, and it had lighting around it. So I saw the light. I saw some of the colors in the guitar, and I said, "Mine!" It, it just screamed ICM like crazy to me. That is total abstract. But to me, I love sweeping lines. I love curves. I did not explode the lens and rack the lens on this. I moved the lens a little bit while I, I, I moved my camera in a kind of a wiggling pattern. And that's what I got. So this one, I saw a lady, I was on the pier looking down. She was starting to bring her surfboard into the water. And all I did was set it up for an ICM. And I just moved my camera very little from left to right and up and down a little bit. And I got her blurred, which is, you can tell what it is. It looks like a boat, but it really is a surfboard. Because you can tell where I went up and down. Look at the bow of that surfboard. You can tell I lifted it up while I also did that. Because you can see the sweep of the waves. Water is really, really fun. If you go up there after you experiment in the clubhouse, Go outside and shoot the pool. Shoot people in the pool. You can get ghosts in the pool. You've got flowers all over outside, trees all over outside. You got a lot to play with up there. Same thing. I looked down from the boardwalk. This lady was sitting there on a black, on a red blanket in the heat of the day. And I'm saying, mine, just I see him, and that's a lens explosion. That's a racking of the lens. Now this is also ICM. I moved my camera as he was moving. So the background is blurred, but I stayed on him with the same exact speed and got him clear. That is ICM, it's called panning. Now here I did not move my lens at all. I, here I did move the lens at all, but I simply put a longer exposure. The ladies were walking. The pier is, 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 you can see I went left to right which I normally do on the beach. I normally do a, 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 a sweep that's uh, from left to right or right to left. And the shutter speed was slow enough the way they were walking that I got a little blur, kind of sort of ghost-like, but not totally. All right, statue on the wall. I had a question sure. about metering. Matrix meter. I do not play with metering when I do these. Okay, so, so you don't do spot metering. Absolutely um, not. And if you're gonna add a neutral density, do you have to take off your UV haze? Um, it, it, that's a tough question for me, Miriam, because I know that you should, a lot of people say you need to put a UV filter on the front of your lens. I have my own thoughts about that from other people. And I don't use a UV filter on a couple of my cameras. I do on my rocket launcher because I might drop it. But on my regular camera, I don't. And the reason is because you spend all that money for a great lens with glass. Why do you want to put a UV filter for 30, 40, 50 bucks over that, which can't possibly have the kind of glass that your lens comes with? So why would I want to do that? Um, I don't. I use my lens hood all the time and I'm careful and I take chances. But if you do have a UV filter on, I don't think it does much of an impact with the camera when you're shooting. So for me, if I wanted to put a, a neutral density filter on, I'd be putting it right over the lens. But I don't think it would make a difference, Miriam. I really don't. Okay, I just didn't want to put the two of them on, you know, yeah, keep two of them on. Because a UV filter doesn't change anything to do with your amount of light. It lets the full amount of light come in. It's just the quality of the glass and it's a protective shield. Right, That's but the matter. neutral density to blocks it out. I just didn't want to put two, you know, two, two of them on. It won't matter. It okay. won't matter. Okay, here's the sculpture. This is a racking of the lens, a total, or you can move in with your iPhone and you can get it the same way, not quite the same. That would be an explosive radial motion out. You can see it, I racked the lens. Over here, I also racked the lens, but I did it faster. I turned the picture sideways after I took it and I took out part of what I wanted and I isolated it a little bit more and I had a much more aggressive explosion. Here I really isolated. I took my camera, went right on top of the subject and shot that. These are all the same 
thing that I just showed you from the beginning. This is another shot of a lateral diagonal kind of movement. And all that comes from that. I just stood in that glass place and Ben Zayton saw all the colors in that glass. And I said, oh, we're gonna have fun with this. And that's where that went. So part of, part of it, after a while, you'll figure out what subjects work and what doesn't. This was uh, a glass piece, a fused glass piece with some red, green, and blue. Only I made the, you can tell on the explosion, it also doubled uh, the, the blue and the green. But that was a radial explosion. Um, it would be what we would call a still life. Um, as they would say to me in the art and photography, they thought that was rather risky and it didn't go over all that well. I don't care. I like it. I just like the look of it. All right, Green K, Wakota Hatchie, got boardwalks, you got trees. I simply move my lens up. And I got a little bit of a blur of the tree. And I got a ghost, sort of a ghost. One little star of a flower, I just turned my camera like this. Just went like that. That was it. And you can see the sweep and it extends the, the points of the leaves and blurs them and brings them up and brings them out. So it kind of looks like a flame. This is a radial movement where I simply, I did not zoom the lens. I turned the camera versus this which is where I rack the lens in and out. So this was a swirl of the camera with the lens still partway, and that was an explosion of radial racking of the lens of the zoom. This is little movements where I just went like this and I made little curves. I saw some colorful flowers, similar to what Eileen shot earlier, and I got a different pattern of movement. Same thing here, just shot something and just blurred it diagonally with curving lines like this. I just curved and went up like that. And that gives you a different kind of color. Same exact subject with a different rate of speed and a different motion. This is woods. It'll give you a little bit of a feel for shooting bamboo and blurring it out. You might not like it. This was more a comic. We all saw these, the bonsai trees. I looked at Eileen and I said, go with ICM. And there's your ICM. Also in Murakami when we were there. ICM, that's the Zen garden with the bench. This is a picture of somebody on the wall that I really liked. And I said, I wonder what would happen if, and that's what we got out of that. This is Valencia Falls. That was a racking of the lens with infrared. All I did was simply zoom my lens a little bit and I got that focusing here on the trees. And we'll talk about focus for a minute too. This is Van Gogh. This is one of his pictures inside. And that's an ICM of it. I could have done a million of these, which I did. Not that I would ever use them anywhere, but it is kind of interesting to learn. Flowers in a, in a garden. One technique of a diagonal sweep and you can see the motion of the camera going right up. And here's another one that's a racking of the lens, which is the explosion movement with the radial explosion out. These, I couldn't quite tell you what I did. You're gonna, you're gonna look at these and say, really? I think this was a radial motion because I've got some motion. I think I zoomed my lens, waited for the wave, and that's what I got. And here's another one where I really racked the lens because you can see all the, the, all the motion coming up in explosion. And I got what Eileen says looks like the bottom of the United States, there's Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and it also, you know, just created depth. It looks like layers, it looks like a glacier. It is very, very abstract and weird. And if you don't want abstract and weird, you want something that's serene and beautiful, just laterally move your camera here in the late afternoon down on the shoreline when the sun's not coming at you and it's behind you, Wait till about five, six o'clock, you get these kind of pink views out here and just blur, slow shutter speed and blur and go across. So those are my- um, A good variety. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> so, so the bottom line is this. We will go over settings when we go up to the clubhouse. Um, 
And I will tell you that for um, the DSLR, you have a little more ability to, um, to compose. You have a little bit more ability to create more of a, what's the right word, uh, a stronger impact. It's a little tougher with the cell phone to get that, but it doesn't mean, as you could see, many of the shots that we showed up front were, uh, were ICMs done with a cell phone. You have to be not afraid to keep pushing the shutter button. Some people actually have done it in burst mode on the DSLRs or their cell phones. They put it in burst mode and they've taken a lot of shots as they're moving. That's another option. I don't really do that. And you might want to start as Miriam suggested, which was great, take an establishing shot first and then take four or five different shots with different techniques. Take your camera, turn the camera, cell phone. Take your camera, move your camera in and out. Take your cell phone, move it in and out, and then step in and move it in and out. Take your camera and move it diagonally. Take your camera and do this. Then take your camera and do waves. Kind of go with whatever it is the flow of the texture or the form is that you're shooting. Sometimes that helps. If you've got leaves and you've got all those stripes and striations coming up, just bend them a little and exaggerate it. You got to play and you got to delete. And I have a question for you. Sure. I, I don't have much success with it. I have borderline success, but it's my understanding, at least what I think, is you actually have to start the motion before you press the shutter. Is well, that depends. That's a good, it's a good point. So I'm trying to not get too technical here, but if I want to keep a person a little clearer before I start the motion of the woods or the trees or the boardwalk, I might focus and put the camera on maybe instead of a third of a second, I'll go longer with the exposure. I'll, and we're talking about focus too, Ira, it's a good point. I'll start there, I'll hold it there for a fraction of a time before I move it. And what that will do is give me a little more clarity of the person, but less with the rest of it. It's, it's sometimes, and Bob Turing told me this the other day, sometimes he said, when you get to the end of your movement and the shutter isn't completely finished, hold and you get a different effect than you will, is if you go to the end and then the shutter is done, you're still moving and the shutter's clicked. So yes, all those things require you to play a little bit more. And I'm gonna tell you something about focus. If you are, for example, on a tripod, do you ever hear somebody say, take off your vibration reduction, take your stabilization off? Because yes. the camera's meant to seek for it and look for it. And if you have it on, it's gonna look for it and now you're on a tripod and it's not going to find it and it's going to create its own shape because it's the, 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 the lens is hunting and seeking for something in terms of um, stabilization. Same thing with focus. If I focus in the auto mode, whatever focus mode you normally use on your camera is fine. If I focus first and then, now this is really only going to happen with the DSLRs. You don't have to worry about it with the smartphone. It doesn't matter. With the DSLR, I'll focus first and then I flip my camera. Once I've got where I'm gonna go, I flip my camera to manual. So the camera lens doesn't want to keep seeking and hunting for focus. Because if you have an autofocus, as you're moving, it's gonna say, I'm not sure what you want me to do and it'll start seeking and hunting. So you focus first, then flip into the manual mode and then do your motion. I have done it both ways and have forgotten to do that and forgotten to put it back in manual. And a lot of those pictures came out hunky-dory fine anyway. And, um, and I will have to say that Bob Turin, as, as David mentioned earlier, if some of you weren't on, from the art photography, he did a conference on that. He did two of them. And I've shot with him as David has too. And he is just uh, extraordinary when it comes to these images. It's like a Rorschach test. He shoots a ton of them and he deletes a lot and basically what he gets out of it is like a Rorschach test. It's a movement, it's a flow, it's color, it's shape, it's form, or it's a part distortion where you turn it into a painting. Um, there's no limit to your creativity when you do this, which is really very different than all the rules we have to follow the other way. And later on, when you get a feeling for the motion or the movement or what the impact is with it, then play with your shutter speed. Move it from a third, move it to a fifth, move it to a half on your DSLR. On the iPhone, I've also sent out in that link 
with the iPhone, it tells you exactly what settings to start with. And then you can change the amount of blur. You can change the amount of seconds. You can go from one second to two seconds. You can really play with settings, but you need to shoot a lot because every time you change the setting, you're never going to repeat what you get. It's a total surprise, but it's fun because you go, you'll shoot something and you'll look at it and you go, wow, that's exciting. And then if you really edit it ferociously and twist it, turn it, um, change the color, um, saturate the color, desaturate the colors, turn it to black and white, you get something totally different. Eileen, yeah. questions that you might have of things that I might have said, do we cover it all? Do we get it all done? Yeah, I think you can. <laughs> All right, anything you, you need to add that I might have left out with your cell phone? Um, I remember in my beginning, <laughs> in my long history of ICM, <laughs> um, I would move, I would like focus on something I like on the left, then I'd move and then I'd take it the shop and I didn't have my focused item. You, if I'm, in other words, I didn't realize that if it's not in the frame when I, when the shutter closes, it's gone. It, it, that's actually kind of amusing and an interesting point. I mean, she's absolutely right. If if I zoom in so much that I might have literally lost the center of the picture, but. If you are like Eileen is saying, if you take your cell phone or your DSLR and you, you go to move laterally, use your live view sometimes. The only time I don't use live view, and you'll use it on your cell phone all the time, but using live view is if I'm racking my lens. I look right in the shutter, I hold it right up here and I rack my lens this way. I don't really put it out here on live view and then try to rack the lens because I can't hold the camera when it's out here as well. So I don't like the live view on that. Some people might like that. So Eileen had trouble also with where her hands were on the cell phone because sometimes your fingers block this. So it's a matter of, you need something to hit the shutter with. So you've got to figure out how to put your hands on there so you can turn it or you can move the motion, but your second finger has to be ready and clear of everything at all times to hit the shutter. And we'll work with you on your hand position if that's a problem. Most people figure it out after a while. Gee, my thumb is in there. You look at the shot and you got half your finger over the back of the lens. But questions from anybody else? Does this excite us? Is this something that I think we can play with and get creative with? If you keep at it, you're going to get obsessed. And that's where I'm at. <laughs> and one question, please. In, yeah. po in post, how much editing is, is, a, is acceptable? Like, should filters be used or not, et cetera? No rules. No rules. Okay. Anything that you want to create that satisfies your feeling, evokes an emotion, does a wow factor, is beautiful, a sense of serenity or peace, anything that you create. And like I said to Eileen when she was sending me pictures, she goes, here are the pictures I shot. I said, that's not what I want to know, Eileen. What I want to know is send me the ones that you feel special or to you that invoke an emotion that you feel or something that excites you. It doesn't matter that it excites me. It matters that it excites you. This is art. If I go to paint something, you might hate my painting style. You might hate what I do, but I paint the way I want to see it. So this gives you a chance to be creative and answer your own tune, your own feelings. And it's, it's really fun because there are no rules. There's no limits. You can edit ferociously. You can do whatever to it. And right. Right. And, sure. and um, right now, uh, I'm in the process of uh, purchasing a, a new iPhone. And I saw on many of yours, you have the, uh, the 13 Pro, the Pro Back, I think it's called. Yeah. That camera is, is better than the, the 12 camera right now, in your, in your opinion. That's an interesting thought. It depends upon what you're gonna do with the camera in its totality. But I don't really think that the 12 is gonna make any difference at all if you do an ICM versus the 13. The, what, the, what the 13 does, in my opinion, is it shoots better in low light. It shoots better in where there is light, where you're inside. They used to be atrocious. I would never pull my phone out if I was in a restaurant at night. 
You're just never going to do it. It's going to wreck the picture. But they've gotten so much more, so much better about that. Your Zoom is there on the 12 too. You still have the three three lenses right. for the Zooms. Uh, do I use that when I do ICM? If I can't get close enough to my subject um, and I put it on the, the, the highest Zoom I can get, the telephoto, and the bottom line is if I'm so far away from the subject to begin with, ICM won't work because unless I move laterally, I could move laterally and I could move up, but I can't Zoom because I'm, I'm just too far away to begin with. It's not gonna make a difference. But you can do the other. You can still move up and down and move the out. You can do this. You can do all those things, even though you're on a Zoom, but you want the subject to come in closer. But if you're asking me in terms of, is it worth it to, to buy? I love my iPhone 13. I really do. Um, and I usually, when I travel or I go anywhere, it's in my pocket, as it will be in the clubhouse, you'll see. I whip it out, and I usually take an establishing shot before I start with my DSLR. So I know where I was because it's got a location service on it. It tells me where I was and what it was before I start to really destroy it, so to speak, with my sense of creativity with my DSLR. So, uh, and that way my, and I get a lot of travel photography kinds of shots with my iPhone. So I do like it, it does work. So I suggest that what we do is if you have both, bring both. If you only have, because that way you'll tell the difference. If you have just a smartphone, come on up with that. Make sure the app is on it. That slow shutter app. It's a blue, it's, it's in the handouts. I gave it to you in the handouts. Um, and if you, as long as you have the app, Eileen and I can tell you exactly how to set it, um, which is simple to start. It's only a start. Everything that you do from that point on, once you get experience with the movement and the motions and the things, then you play with longer shutter speeds or you play with a greater range of motion or a faster motion. And then the last thing is at that point, when you do all that edit and delete, you will be deleting. You go, oh my God, what is that? I hate it. You'll delete, delete, delete. What, no. Dan, what lens should we put on our DSLRs? If you have it in the clubhouse and where we are out of the pool, if you have an 18 to 55, that's fine. If you have a 55 to 200, that's fine. If you have a 70 to 200, there's a perfect lens for all. I have a 24, 240. And when I rack my lens and my zoom, I don't go all the way in or all the way out. It's way too much of a zoom. Okay. Marty, you had an 18 to 400. So if you're working and you start with a zoom somewhere, you would not zoom the full range of motion of the zoom. It, it will be... I also have an 18 to 135. That's good. 18 to 135 is good. It gives you room to kind of move your body in a little bit, get where you want. Those are all good lenses. If you have like, um, you know, anything larger than that, you have to be careful about how much you're manipulating your zoom because it's powerful. Yes, Art? Listen, I have a 13 Max Pro. I downloaded the app on the phone last night and I can't find it now. Does that does that ever happen? I paid for it. Uh, I put it down. I'm searching for it. I, I don't Whether know when. iPhone you're talking about? Yes, the iPhone 13. But I, I all the way to the left and you get a search bar and type in the slow shutter. Either so, that or just say, hey, Siri, open whatever it is. Yeah. Slow Probably shutter. on the last page. Oh, also, oh, you oh, might oh, have icon. to... I'll, I'll, I'll be up there then. I'll be up there. I'll try it. Come on up there, Mark. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Somebody will help us. We'll but I want to know if I should go oh. up there. Bring it up. Thank you. Anything else? Any I was going to bring my Sony mirrorless, but the new lens that I have has stabilization built into it. So now I have to take the heavier camera. So no, you don't. No, that's you don't. the best I can do. No, you don't. You're not on a tripod. It doesn't matter if the stabilization is built into it. That's different than putting your focus point on manual focus. It can be, sta you can stabilize all day long if you're hand holding. Doesn't matter. So I it's should bring the lighter better. camera instead? Absolutely. Okay, then I, then, do, then I do that. All right. I'll just have to take off the uh, UV haze. Okay. Or not, or not. I'll leave it on because up in the clubhouse, you're going to have dimmer light, which is the perfect place to learn this. And and then you can kind of experiment outside and start in areas where there's a little more shadow and it's not, don't shoot it directly into the sun. Just try to get you back to it and kind of hide the sun a little bit and find a little bit of a subject that's not in bright light. And um, do you ever have to put two uh, ND, NDs on? 
It depends upon how, how is it a one stop or a two stop? What's the ND? No, I'm talking about neutral density. It's at, I think, a right. point three. If, that's, if it's a third of a stop, then you might need two. But I wouldn't worry about it for today. Hmm. We're gonna do a lot inside and those who are ready that want to go outside are more comfortable. Again, wear a mask if you're comfortable. We might be close when we're working with you. So um, I probably Hello? I probably will wear a mask. Um, no, we're not, still finishing I, I, up because I can't talk clearly and show people what we want to show. So, um, but that's it. Let's go up and let's shoot and have some fun with it. Great. Ready? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you guys at the clubhouse. All right, get in the car, bring your cameras, bring your smartphones, and let's go.